of years ago, when I was racing Ironman triathlons, I spent some time training on the island of Lanzarote. It's a place many triathletes love to hate. You can ride for hours without seeing a single car, but the weather and landscape can be brutal. When I first rode there, I had to stop a few minutes into the ride because I couldn't believe how strong the wind was. I thought I was going to get blown clean off my bike. But I'm an idiot and decided to train for the Ironman race there. Now, I'm kind of small, and on a triathlon bike, the wind can really push me around. It was grueling battling the wind. Some days the headwind was so strong that I had to work really hard just to inch forwards at all. And I'd finished fast ascents in such a state of shock to just still be upright that my legs trembled for minutes. I remember at the end of my first eight hour training day of this, being tired and teary and saying to my friends, this course and its weather was too tough for me. I don't think I can do it. A more experienced friend offered me some great advice. She said, try to work with the wind. Don't fight it all the time. Otherwise, I'd just exhaust myself. And initially, I wasn't too sure how to physically do that when you have to go in a certain direction. But through practice, I got better at getting a sense for what the wind was doing and assessing the risk and learning to work with my bike and my body weight. I gradually learned how to judge the crosswinds, how to ride at a 30 degree angle, literally leaning into it. And I shifted my mental attitude. I stopped trying to ignore or fight it. And I developed like a respect for the wind. I used to talk out loud to it, as you do. The wind on Lanzarote was just a fact and it was a waste of my energy to wish it was any different. Accepting and embracing that made all the difference. A good API needs to be consistent, stable, and well-documented. We know this. As consumers ourselves, these are the qualities we want from APIs that we have to use. As consumers, we know how annoying a poor API experience can be. We might be totally dependent on an API for our product, but yet we don't have any control over it. We have to react to it, perhaps sometimes scrambling to get our tool in, um, updated just in time with producers' changes. And that's when we even know about the change in advance. Or we might use a handful of APIs to help with smaller tasks. Maybe someone set up a cron job that runs a script, connects to an API, and produces a monthly report from the data it fetches. We're not monitoring it because it's just a little script somewhere. And it works just fine like that for years. And then the department that reads that monthly report starts to notice that the numbers just look a bit off. So you dig and eventually discover that the API is not returning numbers the same way. So now half the data in that report is just wrong or missing. If an API change is handled poorly, it can be really painful for us as consumers. Then from our experience as producers, there's a certain type of developer who doesn't like things to be wrong. You may know this type or be one yourself. The type of developer who writes scripts to catch the inconsistencies in your code base, refactors the whole test suite to make sure every scenario is covered efficiently. They notice all the details and give the most thoughtful and considered code review. This is not me, by the way. But this is someone you want on your API team. But the struggle for them is sometimes when things are wrong with an API, they have to stay wrong. Sometimes you can't fix things because your users are accustomed to the wrong thing, so fixing it would actually break it. And that can be really hard for some developers to accept. Being able to change the API or not, as the case often is, is probably the biggest pain point we feel as developers of APIs. 
I want to just pause for a second to remind ourselves what an API is and why that ability to change is so hard. For many of our use cases, an API is the interface between our product and its users. It's interacted with via code on the user side to perform something for their product. When we're developing software for humans to use, if we change how it looks or works slightly, the humans might get confused, but they'll figure it out. When it's computers on the other side, that's not gonna fly. Code can't just figure it out. So because our users rely on our API's code interacting in the moment with their code, by the nature of that territory, it needs to be a very conservative space for development. When we're developing APIs, we're bound by many constraints centered around the communication and expectations between both sides of that interface. That's the nature of developing APIs. Similar to the realities of riding your bike in the wind, we're developing it in a landscape of constant constraints. If we want to produce an awesome API, which we know means being consistent, stable, and well-documented, we need to work with those constraints. Trying to fight the reality of APIs, the nature of that interface, is doomed to failure for the product and misery for us as developers. From other areas of development, we might be used to imposing our will on the product, so it might be frustrating for us to not be able to make changes high and when we want, but that's the nature of building APIs. So we can either be miserable fighting those constraints or we can embrace them. One thing that I think is useful for us to remember is that these constraints are good for us too. If you're writing an API for yourself for a hobby project where you're the producer and the consumer, you can do whatever you want, when you want. But this talk is for those of us building APIs for other people to use. You want people to use your product, service, tool. The API might be the foundation of your entire service, or it might enable your product to grow and evolve through the creativity and power of all the tools that build on top of it. The ability to build an ecosystem around your product through the API is hugely powerful for a business. It increases the value exponentially. You're brokering relationships between parties that might otherwise not be able to connect. But each time you break the API, that's one less tool that can work with your service. So these constraints, when respected, offer both sides some protection. They enable our users to lend their trust to build their software on top of ours, and they also enable us to grow and maintain a wide user base that enables us to be successful. So here are some ways that I've found useful for embracing and working with those constraints to help achieve those main principles of being um, consistent, stable, and well-documented. First, to be consistent. We need to be rigorously consistent in how we represent our data. For example, if a user has a property of admin that is returned as a Boolean in one endpoint, then it shouldn't be returned as a string or an integer in another. And you might think, well, of course, we wouldn't do that. And no one would intentionally, but as an API code base or team grows, these inconsistencies can slip through to the public interface really easily. And that's particularly easy to slip through when there are multiple apps that make up um, a public API. So to help avoid those mistakes, we can use Tulin to help maintain the consistency of our API's data. And there are a lot of choices for this. These are just a few. These vocabularies or specs provide a specific way to describe what objects exist in your API, what they look like, and how people can work with them. My preferred option is JSON schema, 
because it's relatively simple, but flexible and powerful. For example, you can use it to validate user input as well as your output. And in this conservative nature of API development, it's usually best to approach any shiny new thing with caution. So it's reassuring to know JSON schema has been around for years, and it's battle tested in production by several APIs that many of us know and know and use, like Heroku, GitHub, and soon Fastly. A schema can be the one source of truth for your API. Knowing that your source for data is accurate means you can confidently use it to do things like um, generate documentation examples, test the representation of objects or your requests and responses, and validate user input. I'm going to talk about JSON schema, but you might prefer to choose a different tool. The important thing is that you use something as your one source of truth. Select the tool that best suits your context, your organization, your code base. So there are some particularly handy tools for working with JSON schema and Ruby. The committee gem enables you to perform validation of user requests of that user supplied input against your schema, which makes it really easy then to provide the user with immediate feedback if say they supply a parameter that's the wrong type or not quite formatted correctly. And you can do that validation centrally before a request even hits specific endpoint code. The PRMD gem enables you to combine and verify multiple schema files, which is super useful. Uh, once you're beyond needing to describe one or two objects, it's much easier to manage those in a smaller chunk of JSON at a time. So you might have one schema file for users and another for teams, say. You can see the schema for some APIs online. For example, Heroku have an endpoint to read the schema for their API. And that's a super useful way to learn through real life examples of seeing the constraints that someone else applies to their data as a complement to the examples you'll find in the docs. And if you're thinking this all sounds fantastic, let's go back to work and make a schema to enforce consistency. It'll be amazing. A word of warning, building a schema file like, a schema file like this is the ideal if you have a greenfield project or just have the luxury of a fresh start. If you have an existing API, you probably can't apply a schema in all those ways immediately because you probably have a whole bunch of inconsistencies in your API. You might not know about them all yet, but uh, if it was left up to humans at this point, you probably do. And that's okay. Everyone has skeletons in their API closet. So where you don't have a schema, a safer starting point would first be to get a measure of your inconsistencies. So you could take a close look at your documented responses, run some comparisons between the response examples in your docs and the responses you get when you actually make a call to the API. It might take a bit of time to set up a test account with sample data and you might need to parse the examples you give in your documentation, but then you can write Ruby scripts to make real requests to your APIs for each of those and compare the results against the documentation. You could note where and how the responses are different. Are there any additional keys or missing keys in the hashes? Are any of the attributes classes different than you said you were? Any of those booleans that are actually a string? I did this recently, and even the exercise of reading your docs and forming all those requests is highly beneficial. It's a really good way to familiarize yourself with the public interface and see things from the consumer's position, build up that, that empathy. You could create a schema for a small portion of the API. Say in your app you have a user object and some endpoints for users. You could try writing a schema just for those and then run your tests for the user endpoints against that schema and see how many of your tests fail and how they fail. 
You could even do that in production and just log where the mismatches are. And if the output is actually what you really want, then you can correct the schema um, to reflect that. But if the schema was correct and the output doesn't match it, then you can't change that output immediately because that's the output your users are, um, have got used to, so it would break things on their side if you um, fixed it. And then it can be really interesting and pretty effective to get a better understanding of the inconsistencies by taking a deep look through the code, through parsing the code, using code to analyze the code. I've used the white quark parser for this job, which is a parser um, for Ruby written in Ruby. You can use this gem to parse your code and form abstract syntax, syntax trees, ASTs, which as the tree name suggests, gives you an object that you can then crawl around in to find the branches and leaves that you're most interested in. And this doesn't need to be pretty or polished. My own scripts that do this are definitely not. Um, but this kind of tooling isn't going into production. So it's okay to be dirty. It's purely to help you explore the code and to tell you things that you're curious about. For example, you could use a parser to peer into endpoint code and see what's being called. Like maybe you'd monitor and measure the calls around authentication. You can note what methods are being used, what arguments are passed to those, what classes the arguments are. Parsing the code with code is hugely powerful, but just exploring this at all can give you really useful insights. Seeing your inconsistencies can help you make decisions about them. Maybe you've done a thing three ways, but now you can pick the one way that you want to um, deliberately choose for the future. I've done this recently for the code base at Fastly where the public API is formed across multiple apps and it's given us insights and measures into a ton of useful information that would be otherwise pretty difficult to do. And I think as a bonus, looking and measuring these things can set you up really nicely to basically have a custom linter that would help you monitor your code in the future. So getting to consistent data might be a methodical process with painstakingly slow work, but, but then it will be amazing. <laughs> the second big principle, a good API is stable. If you do one thing, I recommend it simply to think deeply and write down what the API is for, what each endpoint is for. <clears throat> this sounds so simple that many people don't do it, preferring instead to dig into the more technical work of writing code or specs. But even with API-specific specs, I think you get distracted by the syntax and the opinions of the tooling and all that can come later, but as a starting point, I believe it's way more beneficial to write down just in plain language what the API is for. And that seemingly simple thing is actually really hard to do, but it's vitally important. So in a high level design for an API, I recommend including the usage examples for any new endpoints. What would users do with it? What variations might they do? What workflows would it need to support? What does your business need from it? What are the potential performance issues? What would happen if there were 10,000 of the objects that could potentially be returned? What does it look like? like? What does the path look like? Are there any parameters in the path? What do they look like? And what will you call it? Keeping in mind that if you can't think of a neat title for an endpoint, that's probably a, uh, probably a sign that your design is a bit off. And remember, of course, there's a cost in adding new endpoints, more code to write, test, maintain, document, and do code review for. So you want to consider, do we really need this addition? 
Do you really want to walk that dog every morning when you're tired and there's a blizzard blowing outside? And write those high-level design docs before you write any code, before you've invested in a particular approach, you know, while the cost of change is low. The more thought and care you put into the API design up front, the more chance of shipping the right thing in the first place and reducing the risk of change later. So we need the API to be a calm, predictable, and reliable space. But that interface is surrounded by things which are not calm. Everything is changing. Our product, the technology choices to build and document our API, our users' needs and workflows, our assumptions about our users' needs, our legal obligations, security vulnerabilities, bugs in the code, our teammates, our company's leadership, their priorities. The API is at the center of a constant state of flux. And on top of that, our API also has to change in order to stay relevant to that wider context. So the stable center has to change with everything else, but that change has to be very controlled, if indeed it's even possible. So we have this constant friction between the need to change and our constraints. As developers or shepherds of the API, it's good for us to be aware of that friction and the demands for change, but not to react to all of those demands all of the time. We need to optimize for walking the API along a very stable, thoughtful and calm path through all of that. Sometimes that will mean pushing back against some of those forces that might disturb the calm center. That might involve asking a lot of questions, helping to find creative ways to absorb the problem on your side rather than inflict it on the consumer, or sometimes saying no or not yet. Shepherds of the API often aren't the most popular people in the engineering org. So hey, if, if you too don't mind being unpopular, come join your local API team. Some literature on API development will say that change is bad and therefore you should simply never make breaking changes to an API. I don't buy that approach. To me, it's not working with the constraints, it's more like punting on them. And don't get me wrong, breaking changes should be very rare and a last resort, but in reality, the need will arise. We need to be able to evolve our API along with our product and respond to emergency situations like a major, avail major availability or security problem. And if you really think about it, change itself is not necessarily bad. It's negative impact from change that is bad. So the goal is to minimize the negative impact. A great way to help with that is to provide transitions. Provide a transition workflow or a way for users to adapt to the new thing. And that could take different forms. One, um, would be previews. For example, the GitHub API releases new or changed endpoints under a preview, which is a specific accept header that you can opt into using. Versioning, for example, the Stripe API offer very granular versions on a date basis and commit to supporting all previous versions, which must be a huge undertaking um, behind the scenes. With either of those approaches, you just want to make sure that users can use multiple versions, say one on staging as they try out and prepare for new behavior, but continue to use a different version um, on production. Another simple way to provide a transition, say for example, if you really need to change the name of an attribute, you could provide both the old and the new names for some transition period before you remove the old one. Whatever form you choose, 
or combination thereof, that the key is to provide a way for users to transition to the new thing gracefully. But accept that the reality is we may not be able to reach everyone and that some users may not take any action. So it's highly unlikely to achieve zero negative impact. The only way to get to zero is probably if you have zero users, in which case, cool. <laughs> the goal is to, mean, to minimize the negative impact as much as you can reasonably do. And lastly, an awesome API needs to be well documented. Provide clear information to users on how you intend to change or break the API through things like documenting your deprecation policy, for which I recommend you provide generous conservative timeframes for. Expectations around any kind of pre -da, uh, beta or preview periods for which I recommend you provide short timeframes for. Otherwise, people forget it's not really the final version or not really um, suitable for production. And do provide a change log with specific information on all the changes and how developers can adapt to use those. Being explicit and transparent about these things gives users some confidence in the process and builds trust which is a crucial ingredient to sustain an awesome API. And then remember that people don't read. <laughs> so even if you've given all the notices and warnings, news of upcoming changes won't reach all your users. Even with the best will in the world, even with great monitoring and usage metrics, you might not even be able to reach some of your users Maybe you allow anonymous user requests, or the people that wrote the code using your API are no longer the people who maintain it or care. The first time some people will notice a change is when their thing that depended on it stops working. To help compensate, you can also make use of brownouts, where after all the regularly timed notices, you would schedule a deploy of the change temporarily, maybe even just for an hour, but just enough time for people to freak out. And then you withdraw that and give people more time to adapt to the upcoming change on their side before you make that switch for real. There's so much detail to get right on an endpoint by endpoint basis that it's easy to not look up and see the overall picture but it's highly beneficial to provide a way for some people to see a holistic view of the API, and I mean inside your company, um, I should say, but even having scripts that can capture a measure of key data points, which maybe you just stick in a spreadsheet, could give your API or product team some really useful insights. And again, the beauty of this work is that it doesn't go near production, so it doesn't have to be pretty or polished, just something that, enab that enables you to take a holistic view of that data just whenever you need to. For example, you might capture a note of things like which endpoints are undocumented, which endpoints are in some state of not public, maybe a private beta or preview, and what date did they enter that phase. Anything that's earmarked to be deprecated and um, when those are due to be removed altogether. In order to collectively build and maintain that consistency and stability, you need to govern choices and decisions. Having written down internal guidelines on how your company builds APIs um, would just make it easier for everyone, both current and future teammates, to build a consistent, stable API. Make sure you have clear guidelines on how to make changes. Any ambiguity around A for how to make changes can be a major source of stress and frustration for engineering teams. So set clear expectations and share guidance internally on what's okay or not okay and how to go about making changes. It's super useful to have an internal API style guide where if it's a RESTful API, you might include things like what patterns for paths are, are okay or not okay, 
or that URLs with a verb or adjective in them is a smell. So you could encourage a default of designing to work for that 95% use case and allow filtering to fine tune some results. Of course, there will be exceptions to any rule. One example from the GitHub API, there's an endpoint to fetch the latest release, which clearly has an adjective in the path. And that was a conscious design decision because users almost always want just the latest release. So for that exceptional type of case, it's, it's a better interface if it optimizes for that common use, use case, even if it's not textbook restful. Some choices will be uncontroversial where there's a fairly clear good design and bad design. With some choices around how you implement an API, there is no correct answer and people will have valid arguments for different approaches. But here's the thing, most of this, the specific choice doesn't really matter. What's important is that you make a choice and apply it consistently. Your internal guidelines will always be guidelines and just decisions will need created by humans weighing up the trade-offs. So lastly, in your internal doc documentation, I highly recommend writing down who is responsible for what. To build and maintain an awesome API, your group needs to have a clear understanding of ownership and the decision-making process. When that's ambiguous, it creates frustration and just wastes time and energy. Also, it encourages poor quality code as endpoints become orphaned if no one specifically owns them. No one fixes the flaky tests or bugs that arise because, hey, it's not their code. So I recommend carefully deciding and writing down things like who's responsible for building APIs for new features, who's responsible for the underlying concepts, the plumbing, and with documentation, who's responsible for which parts of that work. Everything needs an owner, a responsible party, and that information should be written down and easily discoverable. And then who gets a say in the decision-making process? I find many people get uncomfortable um, setting out a decision-making process up front, maybe preferring to just try and attain consensus. If that's the case in your group, I suggest it's worth asking, what happens when we can't? And maybe it's worth writing down that answer, you know, just in case you don't have consensus. So that island of Lanzarote became one of my favorite places to train and race. I spent weeks and weeks out there. I got to know the roads like the back of my hand. It made me a better athlete, not just with technical skills, but with my mental toughness. And sure, I love to ride my bike on a calm, sunny day, but I know I can adjust my mindset and embrace the day when the conditions get tough. I love working with APIs. I'm not even despite, but because of the constraints that come with that territory. I love making something that helps other developers make something that people would choose to build on top of what I build, that's a pretty special thing to be part of, and I take that privilege seriously. So I hope you find something useful in some of these ways that I find helpful to work with the constraints to build awesome APIs. But the important bit is that you don't fight your constraints. Know what they are, plan for them, work with your constraints. And I want to leave you with this quote. It doesn't have to be fucking hard. It just has to be consistent, which is fucking hard. <laughs> He's talking about training for Ironman triathlons, but I think that sums up API development pretty well. Thank you. <laughs>